everybody talks about space as kind of this, um, you know, frontier that's so scary and a different world, but maybe we underestimate the power of deep ocean depths as well. But we learned about it this past week. So I want to dig into this. Can you start by giving me a little bit of background on you and your experience with ocean exploration? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. And I have been incredibly fortunate to have some amazing jobs, people might say adventures, where I have I have actually lived underwater for one week and then again for two weeks to study the ocean and do communications in the world's only undersea research station, Aquarius Reef Base. I was their chief scientist for a couple of years. Um, I ran a marine lab in the Bahamas. I've done a lot of scuba diving down to maybe, you know, typically 100 feet. I don't really, there's no reason most of the time to go much deeper than that for, for the kinds of things that I've studied, but I've done a lot of diving. And I've been fortunate enough to go down in a couple small submersibles down a couple hundred feet. I fortunately haven't been able to get deeper. I'd love to go to one of the vents, you know, 100 thermal vents, but haven't had that opportunity. But I have a lot of colleagues who have, and I've written about it in books. So did you have training going into one of those subs? So I think across the board, no matter if it's scuba diving, living underwater, going out in a boat, or uh, going in a small submersible, you always get training. Because honestly, with all the groups I've worked with, safety has always been the number one priority. And so that's not only extensive training, it means having really good executable emergency response plans. You know, there's criteria and standards for the equipment that you're using. So safety is always at the forefront. And what is the trip like in a submersible? Can you tell me the length, what conditions are like inside? Right. So it really depends on how deep you're going. So I'll tell you, in the, in, even in the case of a shallow, going shallow, relatively shallow, you know, a couple hundred feet, you go from... You know, let's say it's warm on, on the surface and you're in the submersible and you enter the water and it's kind of a royal blue, light blue. And as you go down, it obviously gets, starts to get colder and it gets darker. And, you know, these subs that are going to a thousand feet or more, it's going to be pitch black down there. It's going to be freezing cold at the bottom of the ocean. And of course, huge amount of pressure. And even in shallow water, you really see that distinct change. You know, when I'm saying challenge a couple hundred feet you see that distinct change right away. And one of the things that happens that sort of little the off-putting when it happens is, for instance, I've been diving out in Florida in the Bahamas in one of these subs and it's hot on the surface. And when you get down to 100, 200 feet, it's cold. And so often you get condensation on the inside of the sub and it starts dripping. And you don't realize it's condensation. You're like, there's water coming in the sub. Oh God, that's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying. And then you don't be like, no, no, it's just condensation. You're, you're good. But- especially down deep, the idea of any water coming in from outside where a tiny pinprick or crack, anything would be horrible given the high pressures. So even a little drip of water is a little bit, is, is very disconcerting, even shallow. For sure. And, you know, I think about like, so the atmosphere, you know, we're atmospheric scientists, we think about pressure decrease as you go up, but it's the opposite as you're going down in the ocean. And I, you know, I dove in a pool the other day, eight foot pool, and my ears popped eight feet. So what kind of pressure are we talking 1300 feet down at the surface of the ocean? Right. Well, so think of it this way. So for about every 33 feet going down, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure essentially doubles. And so if we think about when the sub accident, 1200, um, 12,000 feet down, it was about over, over 300 times the pressure at the surface. So immense pressures, obviously, um, you know, anything with air completely crushed, any structure that is not incredibly strong will be crushed. And that's why like the sort of workhorse of the submersible field is the Alvin out of from Woods Hole. It has a titanium sphere. There's another type of sub I've been down in the Triton subs, which are patented sp sphere. But again, where you sit is a sphere. And they use one material in a spherical shape because that's the strongest you can have to withstand the crushing pressures. Why is a sphere the strongest? It's just the structural integrity it provides. And if you think about the, the sphere and where you know, you're getting pressure on every single side, it's going to be essentially the same. So 
you know, over time, the people who designed subs discovered that that was uh, the best, the strongest uh, shape to use. And that's why these subs that have been so successful, where you sit is in a sphere. Have they had portholes to look out of? They have what are called viewports. And they tend to be very small, again, because of the problem with pressure and there's an issue with having two different types of materials together. So typically the viewports for the deep sea submersibles are saddenly small. Yeah, it makes it hard to view, but safety first, like you said. So I'm curious what you know about the Ocean Gate submersible and the materials used and the viewing hole for that. Well, I was not involved with the design or testing, but certainly from what I've read and what I've heard from marine experts, you know, people who build subs, is that they obviously their design was very different. It was a cylinder with two titanium caps on the end. So you so it was a sort of a cone or cylinder shape, which is very different than the typical submersibles. And they were using a carbon fiber material combined with the tit titanium, which again, uh, my understanding is you don't want to have different materials together because it weakens it when you go down under pressure repeatedly. So it was a, it, and they, OceanGate admitted, it's even written, and I've read about it, saying that it was an experimental design. Um, and they actually didn't want to get certified because they felt that it would stall their innovation. So I think from somebody who has been involved with a lot of undersea operations where safety has always been the first priority, you know, to me, that was a little shocking and, and very uh, unfortunate, as it turns out, tragic. So when you first heard that this was missing, what were your initial thoughts? Because a lot of us thought, oh, they'll, they'll find it. Surely, you know, we can find anything. Right. What were your well, thoughts? So I'll give you two thoughts. One, when they said it was missing and they said they lost communications after about an hour and 45 minutes. When you go down on a submersible, one of the things you're taught is the emergency backup up is if something happens, there are different ways to release your ballast or release heavy parts of the submersible so that you go to the surface immediately because that's your safety zone. And so when I heard that they lost comms and that they didn't come right to the surface, that was very concerning for me. It to me meant if they couldn't get to the surface, either their design was inadequate or something catastrophic had happened. Um, finding a sub, if they had gone to the bottom, if they had sunk to the bottom, finding it would be incredibly difficult, particularly because it appears that the mothership or the support ship didn't have an, a remotely operated vehicle or anything that could go down to that depth and look for it. Typically on a lot of submersible operations, they will have an ROV on board that can go down. Let's say you get entangled or you need to cut something away, they could send an ROV to see what's happening. Some submersible operations even have a second submersible on board in case something happens and they need to go see what's happening. Um, they didn't have either of those at, uh, apparently. So finding it, not knowing where it is and you know, near the Titanic, had it drifted off, a very small area to find something in the deep sea. So that it would have been, it was, uh, and we saw was incredibly difficult. So do you think it'll be difficult to find wreckage? Oh, they've already, they've already discovered the wreckage field. They are now, or may have already finished mapping the wreckage field. And now what they will probably do is bring up specific pieces of the wreckage that might give a clue as to what exactly happened. And that that's, you know, obviously they want to know what happened, not only because of the tragedy, but also because we need to prevent something like this from happening again. Right, absolutely. So I know that we don't know yet. Um, do you have any thoughts on what could have possibly happened? It looks like the submersible imploded, which suggests that there were some weakening or some flaw in, in the structure and let water in and then the pressure just took over. So, you know, I, it was clearly a catastrophic issue and what exactly where on the sub that was we won't know until they do more investigation and of course it's it's very sad obviously uh you know fatalities i think a lot of people are curious what a um you know a deep sea death might be like do you, can you tell us about that the idea that they were happy they were on the bottom and their air supply was running out was horrendous 
because they wouldn't have gotten rescued. They, there was no way they would have been rescued. So honestly, it's a horrible tragedy, but they didn't suffer. It would have been immediate. It would have been instantaneously. Interesting. Um, does this make you fearful at all about ever getting back into a submersible or do you feel confident in um, your expertise and knowing the right situations to be in? So the folks that I have worked with, they go through the certification process. They work with marine experts, people who have a, had a long history of designing these subs. They go through extensive testing. So for me personally, if I were to get the opportunity to go to the Alvin to go look at hydrothermal vents, I would be there in a heartbeat. So it really is about the testing, certification, the credentials, in, in the field of the, the people you're working with? Do they have an emergency? You know, part of the certification process is, do you have an emergency response plan that's executable if something happens? So I would feel confident going with the groups that regularly do this, who are certified, and again, have built these designs that have been safe. The, the safety record of the submersible community is nearly impeccable. It's incredible. And again, it comes from, the process of how they're built and certified. It's interesting, you know, we go to space with these very high standards and then there's this partnership between government and private sector. Do you think that ocean exploration could benefit from the same sort of partnerships? Well, there has been some. The Navy has definitely partnered with Woods Hole um, and NSF has partnered with Woods Hole on the Alvin Submersible. There's been a very strong partnership there. Um, one of the things I think we could do better is we need a lot more investment from the government in not just ocean exploration, but ocean technology and research in general. The magnitude that we've invested in space is so much more than the oceans. And you know we have to remember the ocean is like over 70% over of our planet. A lot of it, 80% at least hasn't been explored and it's the only planet we have. So. It would be great if we could invest in new technology. I get the question sometimes about, well, how come we're not living undersea now? And that's lack of investment. You know, we have not made that possible. So, you know, maybe that will come out of it. I think safety standards for tourist submarines or submersibles may change. Um, I think the support ship came out of Canada. I suspect Canada is looking at that as well. So I, I think you'll see some changes coming from it. What? I'm not sure they'll be. Dr. Ellen Prager, thank you so much for your insight. This is really great. Is there anything else you want to share with us? Um, you know, I think I think you asked a great question about should we be fearful about going into the ocean? And I don't think whether you're on a submersible, um, on a boat, you're scuba diving, as long as safety is the top priority, the ocean is actually very safe. But you have to be careful. You know, even scuba diving, people who willy-nilly scuba dive don't get the training they need. It can be dangerous. And so the ocean is a wondrous, fantastic place to go. And there's so much for us to learn and see. We have to do it safely. If you like this content, you'll love our podcast. Check out Off the Radar. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts or click the link in the description of this video.